Lincoln here in uh, 2006, he graduated. He was Dean Medalist winner. Um, and today we're going to hear a speech from him, or a lecture from him, about um, some of his work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. As Stephen said, I was at one time a while ago an undergraduate here, so this is a really a great honor to be invited to speak. I actually had courses in this very room, and I want to especially thank you. Doctors Jordan and Bestick for being here tonight because they were very influential in my undergraduate career in this very classroom. So, special thanks to them. But I'm going to be talking about for a little while this evening, and I promise I won't go too long because I know you all have more exciting things to attend to this evening. Um, is some of my own research. So, when I graduated from here, just a little bit about myself, I went to the University of St. Andrews in Scotland where I did a Master of Letters in Modern History. Uh, from there, I went to the University of Cambridge where I completed a PhD in history under the supervision of Sir Richard Evans. So I finished that a few years ago, and I'm currently a lecturer in this department and a couple of other departments on campus. So I presently have the pleasure of teaching History 129T, which is a special topics course in the Jewish Studies um, project, or the Jewish Studies program, I should say, about anti-Semitism from the medieval modern world. So some of my students are here tonight, and thank you. And I'm sure the extra credit had nothing to do with your presence here. So uh, again, thank you all for attending. What I'm going to be talking about tonight is the interwar British Empire. So I'm really going to be talking about sort of the interwar radicalism that emerged in Britain around the time of Hitler's ascension to power in 1933. I'm going to be looking at that sort of a general sense, then focusing it on an individual who I'm currently working on, and we'll talk a little bit about the project I'm doing at the moment. But first we need to step back into the milieu, if you will, of the 1930s. So obviously after 1929, when the American stock market crashes and there's a huge economic downturn, there's an expansion of economic and political radicalism across Europe and the United States. So, after about 1930, we begin to see the emergence of radicalized groups in Britain, particularly, that believe in overthrowing a democratically elected state. Now this, of course, to us appears to be a very radical view today. There's not many groups that go around saying we should do away with elected government or something like that. But in the 1930s, this was seen as a view that was at least somewhat defensible due to the huge downturn that had taken place in the economy and the apparent failure of democratically elected legislatures to deal with these problems. So, in, at the conclusion of the First World War particularly, which is 1918, so a bit before, we have this critique of society, this critique of democracy, that says, hey, maybe democracy can't account for all the problems in society. Maybe democracy isn't an adequate solution in that way. So in 1918, we hit the beginnings of that. In 1929, those visions appear to be somewhat vindicated for these anti-democratic groups when the entire world economy tanks, effectively. So Britain in this period, much like the United States, not as extreme as Germany, but there are serious problems at that point. The other main thing that happens in 1917, a little bit before the end of the First World War, before the end of the First World War, is the Russian Revolution. So in 1917, the Tsar is overthrown, there is a transitional government, and finally the Bolsheviks under Lenin take over and establish a dictatorship of the proletariat, or so they claim in that sense. So this is a major event in European history. Not only because now one of the great monarchies of Europe has been dismantled before Germany is actually defeated, but also because now people who are counter-revolutionaries, people who fear revolutions at home, see Russia as a negative example. So many of the people I'm going to be talking about tonight see Bolshevism, see the expansion of communism as the main threat to society in this period. And this is an area of really fertile research at the moment. There's been a couple books I'm going to talk about at the end discussing the United States that have come out in the past two months. Very controversial works about the debate over entering the Second World War. We forget that in 1940, before Pearl Harbor, there was possibly a majority opinion in this country that the United States should not enter the war. One of the things that I've done since I came back to campus here after, after leaving graduate school was do some research in the Collegian Office, uh, which has a fantastic archive of papers from the 1930s. The Collegian was all the way back to about 1922 or so. And in the 1930s and 40s, the debate on this campus before Pearl Harbor was, should America get involved in another war? Right before 1941, like late 1940, the Collegian conducted a poll of students. An overwhelming majority, something like 70%, said America should not fight on the side of the British Empire. This is an undesirable thing to do. And they quoted faculty experts saying, it's not our fight, we shouldn't get involved in Europe, this has nothing to do with America at all, it's a fight for the British to have. So we tend to forget that this was, if not a majority opinion in this country, at least a large block of opinion in that way. So, that's one interesting aspect. In Britain, this is a slightly different debate. So obviously Britain gets involved in World War II much earlier, but prior to that, British foreign policy had been focused on what we call appeasement. So the idea of appeasement was that a second world war had to be averted at all costs. And this was the position that was taken by particularly the British Conservative Party in this period, which was the dominant political party 
Their argument was, we have to prevent another war because the first world war was so destructive, we're not ready to fight the second one, ergo we have to at least delay, if not prevent, a second war from taking place. So some of the people I'm going to talk about tonight are these appeasers, who simply say, we've got to delay or avert the second world war. Some of the people I'm going to talk about in a moment are also anti-Semites. So, in this period of the 1930s, we have a huge expansion of anti-Semitism, both politically and socially in that way. This is a common factor, as I tell my 129 class, remember there seems to be an economic downturn, there's an associated rise in prejudicial ideologies, anti-Semitism is one of the most common in this period. So, the 1930s are a really turbulent time. This stuff all sort of settles down in 1939 when Britain enters the war, for reasons I'm going to talk about, largely because a lot of these people get arrested by the British government for being possible German spies. But up until that point, there was no guarantee per se about how this situation was going to come out. There were a significant number of people in Britain that thought, A, Britain shouldn't fight a war against Germany, B, Britain should actually be allied against Germany, or C, Britain needed a communist revolution of some kind. These were all fairly radical positions, but again, there was no inevitability about how this was going to come out. In 2009, a um, historian named Richard Overy published a book that some of you may have read. In Britain, it was titled The Morbid Age. I'm not actually sure of the American title, but the premise of this book was that the 1930s were a time of grimness, effectively. Everyone in the 1930s thought the world was ending, the economy was in a shambles, democracy was finished worldwide, and this was going to be the next big thing. These anti democratic movements <coughs> had the solution in that way. So, the most famous British fascist, who some of you may know, is a guy named Oswald Mosley. In 1932, Oswald Mosley, who had been a very radical labor MP, actually, he'd been a socialist, founds an organization called the British Union of Fascists. This is their logo. It looks very fascistic with the lightning bolt, and it's this sort of cult of sort of strength in that sense. Mosley's idea is that the government hasn't done enough to head off the economic downturn, hasn't done enough to prevent things from going awry, and he wants more government intervention in both society and in the economy in that sense. Associated with this, he believes, is some measure of anti-Semitism. So he says he wants to remove what he calls sort of Jewish influences from the British government. I think there's some seats up here. So Oswald Mosley is the most famous British fascist of this period. We actually, I'm going to show you in a moment, he goes off to Nazi Germany and hangs out with Hitler. He actually gets married by Hitler at one point. He's a big Hitler enthusiast in that way. There's much historical debate as to whether he's actually a national socialist on the Hitler-esque model, or whether he's just a fascist with some derivative ideology. But he certainly is interested in fascism as a movement in this time, and advocates for it. So, there's several typologies of Nazi sympathizers during this appeasement period. This is a picture of Oswald Mosley, by the way, in, in his black shirt. The black shirt was the uniform of these guys. These guys were really scary. The British Union of Fascists used to go around terrorizing Jews. They used to go to the east end of London, where there was a large Jewish community beating people up. There's a very famous street battle between socialists and the British Union of Fascists at one point where people were killed and badly injured and things like that. So there's a real climate of lawlessness in this period. The British government actually had to outlaw the marching, marching in uniforms, which is still illegal to this day, simply because of these fascists. So this is Mosley. You can see he's trying to strike a very sort of Hollywood-esque pose there. Uh, apparently, uh, in his days, he considered a very handsome man. He had many numerous affairs with the wives of famous people. So apparently, quite the quite the ladies' man in addition to his fascist activities. But there are several variants of Nazi sympathizers in this period. The first one I've already talked about, these, these anti-Semites, people who are really deeply anti-Semitic. These are people that look at Hitler's regime after 1933 and say, these guys are getting something right. They're removing Jewish influence, they're getting rid of this group, they're putting the German economy on the right footing by eliminating the, the Jewish international conspiracy or something like that. We're going to talk a lot about conspiracy theories in a moment. So, the anti-Semites see Hitler as a positive example in that way. The second group, is somewhat related to this, but at the same time distinct. And these are the people that believe that what Mosley and Hitler have correct is viewing communism as the biggest threat to society. So they're deeply anti-Bolshevik. They think that actually the, the British Labour Party, which is the central left party, is actually being controlled by Moscow. They see the tentacles of the communist conspiracy in all facets of society. They think Stalin is planning an invasion or to overthrow the government on any day. Of course, this gets more and more sort of weird type of conspiracy theory stuff the further out you get. But they view the USSR as the real enemy. The most extreme people in this group actually believe that Britain should possibly ally with Nazi Germany to fight the Soviet Union. And this was a view that exists in the United States as well. Even in the last days of World War II, there were some extremist voices in the American government that believed that General Eisenhower should ally with the remainder of the SS and fight the Soviets back to Moscow when they meet in Berlin. 
So these views were out there. These were not totally marginalized until sort of after the Second World War. They still actually exist in some circles today. The third group of people, so those are actual Nazi sympathizers. Those are people who look at Hitler and admire him and say, this guy's doing something right. The second group are the appeasers themselves. So these are not necessarily Nazi sympathizers, but these are people who look at this international situation and say Britain cannot fight. There is no way that Britain in 1938-39 could possibly fight and expect to win a war against Germany. In part, it doesn't have enough men, it's lost too many in the First World War. The economy is a shambles, the German economy appears to be much stronger at that point, and there's just no chance that Britain could fight and possibly win. This is the view that is the official British government policy until really 1940, even after the war begins. Neville Chamberlain, who was the Conservative Party Prime Minister in this period, goes to Munich in 1938, meets with Hitler, turns over the Sudetenland, dismantles Czechoslovakia, and says, yeah, fine, you can have your demands here, just, just don't do it again, type of thing. It's the idea that Hitler has to be appeased in that sense to avoid the outbreak of a second world conflict. So these are the main typographies of people that, that I essentially look at. These guys are really interesting. The appeasers are, come from a wide variety of backgrounds. Many of these guys are essentially the conservative parties into intelligentsia, I should say, in this period. So, this guy named Lord Londonderry, who's an influential sort of guy in the House of Lords, he goes off and meets with Hitler. These guys, fascinatingly, we have all of these records, so we can see what these guys did. They actually set up vacation trips to Nazi Germany. So you could sign up, like Dr. Den Best did's Russia trip, you could sign up and visit <laughs> Nazi Germany and learn all about how great the SA is and the SS and all of those things. What was that? Or visit Nazi Germany next, that would be an interesting trip. But yeah, so I mean, fascinatingly, I, I, I read some of these diaries from people who did these things. They talk about going to visit concentration camps and work camps and things that we would see as really horrific, and they comment favorably on them. And you get these letters to the editor of publications like the Times of London saying, I've just returned from Berlin on a trip with one of these organizations. It's so clean, you don't see litter anywhere. Why can't Britain be more like Nazi Germany? Why is there so much graffiti in London? Type of situation. This is weird to us today, but at the time, this is seen as a legitimate pursuit, at least by people who are in this appeasement camp. And again, this is the British government's official policy in this period. Maybe not as sympathetic to Hitler as some of those authors I'm talking about, but indeed they are viewing it as an experiment that's worth pursuing. The most famous of these people is a, a face in the name you'll probably recognize. It's not face because he's on the poster advertising this lecture, but Edward VIII. So Edward VIII is briefly the king, briefly the king of England. He abdicates very famously because he wants to marry his, I guess you'd call her his, his girlfriend at this point, who was an American divorcee named Wallace Simpson. That's her there. So he's briefly came in 1936. He abdicates in a major constitutional crisis in Britain. And following his abdication, does some things that strike people as a little bit strange. And one of the stranger things that he does is goes off and hangs out with Hitler for a few weeks in Berlin, takes photographs with him, participates willingly in Nazi propaganda, it appears, and actually does some stuff that the, later on Winston Churchill, who becomes Prime Minister in 1940, will accuse Edward VIII of being at least defeatist and possibly a borderline traitor to his country. So Edward VIII certainly is unhelpful to people who want to confront Nazi Germany. He seems vaguely sympathetic, at least to Hitler. doesn't seem to have major moral objections, at least, to what's going on in Nazi Germany. Later on, Edward VIII, of course, lives into the 1980s, I think, he gives interviews and is asked to explain this, and says, well, I wasn't really a Nazi sympathizer. I just thought communism was the real threat. I just thought that Hitler properly recognized that communism was really dangerous and scary, and he, we needed to confront it more aggressively. So he fits into that taxonomy as someone who probably harbors some anti-Semitic views. There's certainly many statements on the record where he says things that we would consider anti-Semitic today, at least. Certainly believes that communism is the real threat, and Hitler is the way to confront it. Hitler is the, the strong man of Europe in that sense and needs to be supported. So Edward VIII really gives a lot of credence to these views in the late 1930s, this view that Hitler, maybe not so bad, maybe he's just misunderstood or something like that. Again, we find these things rightly reprehensible today, but at the time this was seen as a fairly radical stance, but not something that's beyond the pale. So that's sort of the general taxonomy of the people that we're dealing with. The guy that I focus on, the person I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the night, is a guy named George Pitt Rivers. George Pitt Rivers was in this same milieu as actually Edward VIII. We know that he and Edward VIII knew each other, they were social companions in that sense. 
George Bear Rivers was a British aristocrat who, born in 1895, his family has this incredible lineage. He's actually related to Pitt the Younger and Pitt the Elder, the two famous prime ministers, sort of a derivative branch of that family. Goes to Eton, knows all the right people, does all of the right things, inherits this huge estate in Dorset, and sees himself primarily as a farmer and a scientist. Now, we see this as kind of a strange combination today. But at the time, he sees himself as continuing the great traditions of his family. So he sees himself as a guy who has this great personal... I, I always think he looks like a movie villain here, actually, with that mustache. And the, you know, he's dressed, obviously, with a very a little bit too enthusiastic, maybe, about what's going on in Germany. It's very good to talk about it. But he attends Eton, so he knows all the right people. He knows Winston. He's a relative of Winston Churchill, actually. He's a part of the Churchill extended family. He's also deeply involved with all of these sort of far-right circles. The key thing about him are, is two factors, I should say. Factor one, he is deeply, deeply anti-communist and anti-socialist. And even when he's at Eton, there are writings that he does as sort of a, a child of 10 or 11 years old where he says that communism is going to destroy the British Empire, communism is going to dismantle everything that's good in the world, it's the crushing of human will, all of these sort of positions in that sense. So he's deeply anti-communist. At the same time, he is deeply anti-Semitic. Now, those two positions are not different in his mind. So his belief is that communism is a Jewish construct. He believes that the communist revolution in Russia, which we're going to talk about in a moment, is actually brought about by the Jews. And he thinks there's an international conspiracy of Jewish bankers and Jewish people that have brought this about and made this happen. So one of the projects he's going to engage in, which we're going to talk about in a second, is that he tries to identify closeted Jews or covert Jews wherever he thinks he can find them. And he has some bizarre ways of trying to do that. So this guy joins the military in 1914, a very classic pursuit for an English gentleman of his class. He actually goes to South Africa, is involved in an uprising there. In 1914, he's afraid that he's going to miss out on the great adventure of World War I because he's in South Africa. But fear not, he gets shipped out immediately, he gets wounded within the first week he's on the battlefield. So, and wounded actually really badly. He is it, in this stage of the war, as some of you may know, military tactics haven't quite adapted to having machine guns on the battlefield. So he's a cavalry officer, he's involved in a cavalry charge where they you know, try to charge German machine guns, and many, many people are killed in that sense. He's actually quite lucky. But he never really walked again after that. So he took a machine gun shell that shattered his leg, and he had this horrific limp, and was in a great deal of pain for the rest of his life, which plays into the sort of significance. So, 1914, he's really badly wounded. In 1915, he's back in England and gets married to a prominent aristocrat's daughter. And then he embarks on the academic life. So again, he sees himself as continuing in these great traditions of his forebears. His grandfather, whose name I have up there, General Pitt Rivers, is one of the actual founders of modern archaeology. He was the first inspector of ancient monuments in Britain, which means that he was responsible for preserving things like Stonehenge and preserving these other ancient monuments in that sense. So he sees himself as a continuation of this. The academic field that he chooses to enter is not archaeology itself, but anthropology. So anthropology in this period is undergoing a really significant shift. It's moving from the early view of digging up bones and sort of piecing those bones together, trying to figure out things, things that we associate with almost paleontology today or some of these other human anthropology, things like that. Anthropology is really becoming a cultural pursuit. So when he's at Oxford, Pitt Rivers falls in with a guy named Bronislaw Malinowski, who some of you may know as the founder of really cultural relativism in anthropology. Malinowski's ideas are that you shouldn't really interfere <coughs> with these native societies. You have to observe them as they are to learn what their values are. You can't impose Western ideas on them. So this seems to us to be really sort of you know liberal, wishy-washy stuff. But at the time, this is radical. Right? At the time, Pitt Rivers sees himself, working with Malinowski, as somebody who's demolishing the status quo, as a real revolutionary, and he sees himself as a conservative revolutionary, which is important. He's not, doesn't see himself as a socialist or a communist. He sees his anthropological work as demolishing those things. So he actually writes on what he calls primitive communism in the South Pacific. He purports to observe that some of these tribes on the island he studied in Papua New Guinea, which is so small on Google Maps it doesn't actually show up, right? That's the island. There's nothing there but, but the point in that regard. He's studying these really primitive, or primitive quote-unquote, groups in this period. And he says, I see communism in these people. I see them practicing communistic things in that way. And he says that's not a positive thing. What we have to do is show them sort of self-initiative rather than um, Communal sort of living in that sense. So, this is his primary anthropological work. 
This work is really groundbreaking because he is the first European to ever encounter these tribes. This is still a period where virtually all of these islands are, are really unexplored in that sense. And there's some fantastic accounts that he writes of being shipwrecked and encountering tribes that he describes as cannibals and things like that. Probably these are fanciful stories. But at the same time, this stuff is really seen as groundbreaking in England in that period. So he publishes this work, 1927, The Classroom Culture and uh, the Contact of Races, which is really his doctoral thesis, although he never receives a PhD. Um, and he argued that cultural relativism has to be used to preserve these people's ways of life in that sense. So here's a photograph of him in the South Pacific in that period, studying what appears to be a pile of stones. I'm not quite sure what was so interesting about this, but probably a site of some kind. Um, and there's a huge collection of photographs. He actually is a very keen photographer, so we're going to be looking at some photographs later on from, from Germany, actually. But this is him in his early years. Again, what you can't quite see here is that he would always walk with a gigantic cave in this period. So he's obviously removed the cane or hidden it for the sake of being photographed here. So when he comes back to England, Pitt Rivers begins, or I should say, before he left England to do his anthropological stuff and publish it, gets involved with early anti-communism. So in 1920, he publishes a really controversial book called The World Significance of the Russian Revolution. And this book, we would say today, goes viral in that sense. It's a small pamphlet. It's only about 50, 60 pages long. It's not very well produced, there's all sorts of typos and things in it. But it sort of gets passed along from people, between people, who believe that what's happening in Russia, believe that Bolshevism and the emerging communist state there is a Jewish conspiracy. The essence of this book is that the Jews are responsible for the Russian Revolution. And he purports to unmask, quote unquote, the people responsible for this. So this is obviously insane. Right? This is obviously a measure of insanity, and this is one of his, one of his notebooks actually for this book where he identifies people who are involved in international communist parties, and the ones that he thinks are Jewish, he writes Jew under, but some of them who he can't quite figure out, he doesn't write Jew under, right? So it's very much a view of trying to figure out which of these people are Jewish, which of them are. And of course he believes that most of them, if not virtually all of them, are in fact Jewish in that sense. So this is what we call in History 129 a conspiracy theory, obviously. It's the idea that there's an international Jewish conspiracy that is plotting to do certain things, and Pitt Rivers purports to have discovered this to be the case. No one else, he claims, has figured this out except him. He thinks that there's a sort of unique um, aspect to his knowledge in that way. What's more interesting about this book, though, is the fact that the introduction is actually longer than the text. And the introduction is by a guy who is extremely famous, actually, in the philosophy department, a guy named Oscar Levy. Oscar Levy is responsible for translating Nietzsche into English. He's actually a Jewish doctor who comes to Britain from Germany, translates Nietzsche into English, and becomes what he calls an anti-Semitic Jew, which is really weird. Oscar Levy is a very strange individual. He claims to, he's one of these people that claims to have special knowledge of the Jewish conspiracy, all of these things, claims to have been deeply influenced by Nietzsche, and that's the reason why he's broken with his, with the conspiracy and to reveal the truth type of thing. This guy publishes very widely, he's incredibly well known. Oscar Levy eventually gets deported from England for sort of whipping up uh, hatred between anti-Semites and the Jewish community. So, Pitt Rivers is running in some very high-end circles, but they're very radical circles in that sense. He's beginning to tread into areas that are a little bit dangerous in that way. The other main obsession that Pitt Rivers has in this period, and this is one that has real relevance to Nazi sympathizers more widely, is the eugenics movement. The eugenics movement comes from actually the late 19th century. This is an absolutely fantastic illustration of how the eugenicists view their own field. So eugenics here is the tree, and at the base and the root of eugenics, we see all of these other academic disciplines being listed. So we see biology, genetics, statistics, genealogy, education, politics even down here. Eugenics is the view that science and medicine should control human genetic communities. So the idea is that science and academic learning have a responsibility to shape the future of society genetically. How are they going to do this? By choosing who mates with who is the primary way. So under, in the eugenics movement, they are obsessed with the transmission of what they see as negative hereditary traits. So the most identifiable of these for the early eugenicists are things like mental illnesses that they think are hereditarily transmittable. Or indeed, in the 19th century, syphilis. Syphilis is transmitted to children. Of course, they have no idea how, but they're interested in preventing syphilitic people from producing offspring in that way. 
So the idea of eugenics is controlling human heredity. It's the idea that the human gene pool is malleable and needs to be changed by society, needs to be controlled in that way. Because what happens if it isn't controlled? Well, then eugenicists would say society will crumble because eventually the people who shouldn't be breeding are going to breed more than people that should be breeding. And they point to all sorts of what we would see as bizarre demographic studies showing that university graduates have fewer children than people that haven't gone to university, people who are professionals have fewer children than people who aren't professionals. And they say if this is allowed to continue unchecked, society is going to collapse on itself because you're going to get too many people that you don't want and the people you do want is going to be fewer of. Now, we would obviously disagree with this perspective today because we would say there's social mobility, right? These people move between categories, that's the purpose of education, things like that. Eugenicists say no, there's no actual social mobility at all. They would say if you look at who's been on top in society all along, they would say it's the same groups really. And there's all sorts of weird studies that they use to produce that data. So, Ferrer gets really interested in this movement. I will say this is a respectable scientific movement, it appears to be, when Ferrer gets involved with it. It's actually founded by a guy named Francis Galton, who is a relative of Charles Darwin. So this is derived directly from Darwin's sort of theory of evolution, <coughs> theory of natural selection in that way. And the idea that Galton has is, okay, if we know that certain things happen in nature, if we know that the fittest survive in that sense, well, we need to ensure that that happens in human society as well. So, this is going on before Pitt Rivers comes in. Pitt Rivers joins these societies. This is essentially what I've said. So 19th century traditions, that's Francis Galton right there. Francis Galton's big study that he does is called Hereditary Genius. So this is absolutely hilarious, actually, when you think about the methodology behind this book. Very influential book. Galton writes to a hundred of the, well, more than a hundred, many of the sort of richest, wealthiest, most academically empowered families in Britain. And he writes to these people and says, hey, what did, your, what did your father and grandfather do? And lo and behold, people who worked at Oxford and Cambridge, it turns out a lot of their fathers and grandfathers also worked at Oxford and Cambridge. And Galton points to that and says, well, obviously, these people are really smart. And obviously, so were their forebearers. Therefore, intelligence is genetic. Right? What's wrong with this approach? This is, you guys buy this? Why not? Dr. Investe doesn't. Why not? Class. Yeah, absolutely, right? If your parents go to Oxford and Cambridge, you're probably going to have a certain level of school, a certain level of expectations, money, class, all of those factors. Galton says, no, 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 those are, those are bogus factors, right? Obviously, genetics is at the source of this. So, eugenics is all about the genetic factors of society, the idea that if you can improve the inborn qualities of society, you can improve society itself. If you don't pay any attention to those inborn qualities, society is going to crumble. So that's Galton's sort of class-based approach. In 1933, when Adolf Hitler comes to power, he latches on to these ideas. So Hitler's regime immediately implements the most aggressive eugenic sterilization program in the world. Ah, eugenic sterilization, what's that? Well, it turns out that if you want to improve society, if you want to sort of raise everybody up, some people don't want to play by the rules. Turns out that some people, no matter how much you convince them they shouldn't have kids, still want to have kids in that sense. So, what do you do with these people? Well, the only thing the eugenicists can, can figure out is you either tax them really, really heavily to try to prevent them from being able to afford families, on the one hand, or B, you physically take away their ability to reproduce. So by the 1920s and 1930s, there are eugenics organizations all over the world that are advocating for compulsory sterilization of a group that they call the unfit. Now, who gets considered unfit? Your guess is as good as mine, right? It depends on who you ask in that sense. One person's unfit person is another person's fit person in that sense. So this is a really tough floating definition in that way. Interesting bit of trivia. The most aggressive eugenic sterilization program before 1933 was right here in the state of California. California sterilized more than 10,000 of its residents on a compulsory and often secret basis in mental health facilities, as in they didn't even tell them they'd been sterilized, up until 1933. And this program, by the way, went on until the early 1960s. So this was not only not seen as a violation of patient privacy, personal autonomy, people's legal rights, all the stuff that we would say it is, but it was seen as desirable for the state to do. So California is really the leading edge with this movement in that period. So one way you convince people to 
reproduce more is by encouraging them to. So positive eugenics, this is called. The idea that those people that are considered fit, quote unquote, you want to give certain tax breaks to or certain benefits for having large families, family allowances, things like that. Negative eugenics is removing the unfit or reducing that population through a variety of means. And again, sterilization is the most obvious of those means for the eugenicists. They can't really figure out any other way to do that in that sense. So, in the 1930s, this is the movement that Pitt Rivers gets involved with. He becomes actually a leader in the British Eugenics Society. He's one of the, the predominant advocates in Britain for compulsory sterilization laws on the American model, actually. And then in 1933, when Hitler comes to power, Hitler looks at the American laws, and we know this because he says it in Mein Kampf, actually. He says, I've studied the American sterilization laws, and I find that they are good. I find that these are desirable. So Hitler directly derives Germany's compulsory sterilization law from the state of California. And that's, that's remarkable international history in that way. So Pitt Rivers is looking at Nazi Germany and saying, hey, these guys are on board with sterilization. These guys are on board with this stuff. Why can't Britain do the same thing? So he's sort of setting himself up for being a Nazi sympathizer in that sense. He's an anti-Semite already. We know that from his writings. He's an anti-communist already. He fits into that group of people that thinks that Communism is really scary, and he thinks that eugenics is a fantastic scientific and social program in that way. It seems almost inevitable that this guy's going to get involved with some nasty stuff. So, in the mid-1930s, Pitt Rivers actually gets involved in politics in Britain for the first time. Now, this is sort of early for him. He's not, he's not going to come to his sort of political fruition until later on. But he creates an agricultural organization that advocates for greater farmer rights. Or at least that's supposedly what it does. So... He founds this organization that stands up for what he calls rural Britain in the face of industrial Britain, in the face of modernity in that sense. And this sounds pretty innocuous, except that a lot of Pitt Rivers' views of what the modern world encompass relate to the Jews, relate to the Jewish community, where he says the Jewish brokers that buy and sell our goods rip us off. The Jewish brokers that control the industrial world, they're oppressing the average farmer in that way. So while this seems innocuous, while it's the Wessex Agricultural Defense Association and has a nice little, you know, cow as a logo there, this is really a covert way of getting out these anti-Semitic messages. So this is a totally unsuccessful campaign for him. This is 1933, so this is about the time that Hitler is coming to power. But at the same time, he begins moving even further right. So after 1933, Pitt Rivers gets in touch with Oswald Mosley, who remember I said is the founder of the British Union of Fascists, and begins to plot with him how Mosley can win a general election. So, if you're Oswald Mosley in this period, your view of the British government is that it is effectively ruined. That it's corrupt, democracy has, has nothing more to say, that democracy has run its course in that sense, and consequently he believes you have to take power either through the democratic process itself, which is essentially ruinous, or you have to seize it by force. So Pitt Rivers falls into this sort of view of society that democracy has run its course and is over. He writes, around 1930, nobody really believes any more than God Demos, least of all those who practice his ritual and worship. So he says, even the people who say they believe in democracy, they don't really believe in democracy anymore. It's over in that sense. So in 1935, interestingly, Pitt Rivers actually stands for Parliament and tries to win an election. And he claims that he is an independent candidate. He has no political party in that sense. He has no affiliation. In reality, we now know, Pitt Rivers arranged this entire campaign with Oswald Mosley. This is a document that's in the Pitt Rivers papers where he essentially writes to Mosley, and Mosley writes back into the British Union of Fascist letterhead, and says, hey, here's the terms of our agreement. The BUF, the British Union of Fascists, will not contest North Dorset in this election. Captain Pitt Rivers and his organization is entirely independent but members of the BUF will therefore not be a start to support the candidature, but his members of the BUF are be free to assign his candidature. So he's essentially saying, I'm not going to force anybody who's a fascist to vote for me, but it's strongly encouraged in that sense. So we now have Pitt Rivers sort of running in with these radical circles. He's certainly hitching his, hitching his wagon to the horse of Mosley in that sense. The other main thing that he's involved with in this period, and this is where it gets to be a little bit sketchy, or even more sketchy, I should say, than it already is, is that he gets involved with Mussolini. So remember, Mussolini is the fascist dictator, effectively, fascist ruler of Italy in this period. He is seen by people who are anti-democratic as the model, effectively, for what an anti-democratic leader should be. 
Supposedly, Mussolini has turned Italy around. In reality, now we know many of the economic numbers, many of the sort of benchmarks of success were phony or um, manipulated in some way. But Bear River says essentially Mussolini's doing a great job. He's a great man of action, magnetic leader, while fascism as an ideology actualized among people, and we are tempted to doubt whether Mussolini himself knows how it came about. So what's interesting is that Pitt Rivers admires Mussolini as fascism in practice, but views him as a leader that doesn't even understand his deep held principles. So he sees him as a leader who understands the, the ebb and flow of politics, if you will, but doesn't understand how fascism really works. And of course, he begins to see himself, this guy who really has very little academic training, again, he's an anthropologist who's worked in the South Pacific, begins to see himself as the main progenitor of fascism in Europe. He actually points back to that 1920 work about the Russian Revolution and says, this is where everything began. This is where Mussolini's revolution began. This is what was deeply influential for Hitler. What's interesting is we know that, that Mussolini actually read that book. There was a letter from Mussolini through Pitt Rivers stating, oh yeah, great book, love it, it was fantastic. Now, did he really read it? Probably not, but he at least wrote a nice letter about it to, to him in that regard. So, we're now getting involved with these actual fascist circles in that way. What this eventually results in is an actual connection between Pitt Rivers and Nazi Germany. So, by about 1936, Pitt Rivers is joining organizations in Britain that are closely aligned with the Nazis. And as I said at the beginning, this is not as weird as it might seem today. Obviously, these organizations were deeply reprehensible, very deeply anti-Semitic, all of this horrible stuff. But this was seen as a fairly legitimate political view. Again, there are many people in this period that think that democracy is from its course, that fascism offers at least some lessons. We know now that, that even Franklin Roosevelt looks somewhat favorably on things that are going on in Nazi Germany, obviously not the anti-Semitism part, but economic policies and state involvement in the economy, all of those aspects, he thinks there are some lessons to be learned in that regard. So, what's interesting is that Pitt Rivers is still running in these scientific circles, and he begins to push for a greater alignment with Nazi Germany in scientific aspects. So, in this period, Nazi scientists are centrally controlled. There's no academic freedom whatsoever. Every scientific conference a Nazi scientist goes to is approved by the foreign ministry. It's approved by a central body. You have to get permission to go. And there will actually be someone who's assigned as the group leader who will decide that, or determine and ensure that none of you make any statements to foreigners that could be seen as attacking the Nazi state. So there's no academic freedom at all here. Every Nazi, every German scientist, I should say, is, is effectively having to be a good Nazi in that sense. So Pitt Rivers runs with these people. We have a huge trove of correspondence between German scientists that he knows through various circles and him. What's interesting is that he begins to offer these people help. And he begins to offer these people help in British academic circles. So one of the big disputes in this period, especially among anthropologists, is what is a race? What is this thing called a race? Now obviously for the Germans in this period, it's very important that there's a robust notion of race. Very important that it's clear who belongs to what race, whether they're Aryan, Jewish, whatever the other races are that they have in these sort of essential categories. The predominant opinion that's emerging elsewhere, outside of Germany, is that race is really a construct. Hard to know what a race is. There's no real reason why races exist. It's an anthropological term of convenience, but there's no real essential category. You can't just classify people into races. That's the emerging view elsewhere. The view of Germany is very different. Pitt Rivers actually blocks attempts by British scientists to issue statements attacking German views of race. So he's a member of something called the Royal Anthropological Institute, which is the number one anthropology institute in Britain in this period. And he is sitting on a very important committee that's discussing the principle of race. And on that committee, he blocks the creation of a statement stating that race doesn't really exist. So he's actually doing this, we now know, because his friends in Germany are telling him, like, yeah, you've got to block this. You've got to block this, because if this comes out, this endangers relations between our countries type of situation. So he's starting to go to bat in this period for sort of German interests in that way. The Germans, of course, reciprocate this. So in Nazi Germany, this is a letter from the Pitt Rivers Collection. Uh, this is the, the Reichsnerstand, so this is sort of the one of the agricultural bureaus in that sense. 
This is a letter to Pitt Rivers essentially inviting him to take part in, a, in activities that are being put on by the regime in that sense. We're going to talk about one of those activities in a moment. But the Germans effectively reciprocate his interest, reciprocate his um, friendship in that way. So, the other thing that he engaged in in the late 1930s, and this is now 36, 37, is he begins to travel all around Europe. So he's traveling now between particularly the Sudetenland, Poland, Germany, all of these places that are really becoming important in, in politics in this period. Generally speaking, he couches these as anthropological expeditions, quote unquote. So he's involved with a couple of international scientific organizations and says, oh, well, I'm going to the Sudetenland to see how the ethnic Germans are being treated because I'm a scientific practitioner. And then as we're going to see when he comes back, he writes these articles about how terrible the Czechs are treating the Sudeten Germans and how great Hitler is because he's their champion type of thing. So it's a blending of science and politics. He's presenting himself as a scientific practitioner, but we know, of course, that he is a political practitioner in that way. The other interesting place that he goes is Spain in 1947. Of course, Spain is in the middle of a really nasty civil war in this period. So he takes some interesting photos, I'm going to show you in a moment here, of essentially the war that's going on in Spain. So this guy has gone from being sort of a minor squire in the countryside, a guy who owns a farm type of thing, to being one of the key players on the international scene. He's really the key player that prevents British anthropology from coming after the Germans in scientific circles. He arranges major conferences where Nazi and German academics go and present their ideas in an uncritical environment. He's really becoming a significant person in that extent. Interestingly, he's also an avid amateur photographer. So photography, as some of you may know, is really expensive in this period. It's really tough to, tough to do um, if you don't have a lot of money. But he, of course, is this rich sort of aristocrat, and he has the ability and the money to buy these by his cameras and developed this film. So I'm going to show you a few photographs that he takes here and sort of talk about what they show. So this is a photograph. This is probably Spain, we think, um, during the Spanish Civil War. So this is obviously a bombed out um, ruins here. We think that Pivers went to, to Guernica, the scene of this horrific bombing uh, at some point. It may have documented it. So this may well be part of the Guernica, but uh, certainly taking photographs of, of wartime ruin here. And again, some of these were published in his books. Many of these have never, never been published before. Um, actually, this is the first time these have been shown in the United States. So this is sort of the American premiere of this material in that sense. So this is wartime Spain, another image here of destruction. Again, the Spanish Civil War is really vicious. There's all sorts of street fighting and things of that sort that go on. So many of these images, and again, these are only two of hundreds of them, show destruction. There's some that show dead bodies. Um, much of Pitt Rivers' research that, research that he conducts in this period is trying to find whether or not the atrocities that were committed by Franco's troops were in fact committed by communist troops. So he's very interested in making a political point from these travels in that way. And these images again show a very, very violent landscape. The other thing that Pitt Rivers gets sort of involved with is in 1937 he's invited to the Nuremberg rally. So in 1937, Hitler, this is actual invitation. Uh, if any of you speak German here, it's saying essentially, uh, this is from the sort of regional leader of the National Socialist Party in Frankfurt am Main, saying, with this document, I certify that Captain Pitt Rivers and Miss Sharp, who is his secretary slash mistress, um, are personally known to me and that they are politically um, unsuspect, essentially. They're politically reliable in that sense. They are to the, the Reichsparteitag, the Nuremberg rally, therefore invited. So this is an actual invitation. This document in, in the archives actually is really like folded and tattered. So he must have carried this around for a number of days. Um, but he was obviously going to this event. So this is 1937. Again, this is only two years before the outbreak of the Second World War. And when he's in Nuremberg, he documents this on film. So this is an incredible collection of photographs here of Nazi Germany from the perspective of the British traveler, from the perspective of someone who is a guest of the regime. And here we have one of the sort of more disturbing photos in the collection. Well, there's several disturbing ones, let me show you. But we have here a village that he encounters on his way to the Nuremberg Rally. This is probably somewhere in Bavaria. And it says, our, in the top part of the swastika, it says, Our greeting in this village is Heil Hitler. So the sign would have been outside of every German village. And underneath, an even bolder type, the Jews are not wanted here. So the Jews are not wanted here. Again, he takes a photo of this with the anticipation that this is something he wants to show people back in Britain. These photographs are actually in an album that would have been a presentation album that would have brought out and showed visitors who shared his views. 
So absolutely just stunning photo. Wave. Another one that is an absolutely almost shocking photo, a little more difficult to see. Judas is geshaved, Jewish shop. So this would be probably in Nuremberg, one of the big cities. We have a clothing shop. This sign would have been put up by the SA, the um, Hitler sort of foot soldiers, marking this shop as Jewish, with a clear implication that no one should shop here, type of thing. So we have these incredible collections of photos. Again, this is a clothing shop, um, the Diebman in that sense. And then we have the photographs that actually come from Nuremberg itself. So the Nuremberg rally, as some of you may know, was this multi-day sort of celebration of Nazism in that sense. So it had these incredible displays of military power. The idea was, of course, to show off how strong Germany had become, how strong the economy was, all of these things. It would always include a speech by Hitler. It would include a huge parade. This was documented most famously by Lenny Riefenstahl in Triumph of the Will. If any of you have seen that, probably Dr. Jordan's class. Um, so it would have a speech by Hitler himself. Pierre Rivers was the was in guest of honor to this. So he was a VIP. He would have been behind the scenes. There's a photograph of him with Hitler, actually, which I don't have in this presentation. But he's actually shaking hands with Adolf Hitler. He actually takes like a almost like a Facebook style selfie with him in that sense. So kind of, kind of, kind of weird in that regard. But so this is the sort of the first day of the Nuremberg rally. This is of course a tank in the street, um, essentially showing off. German military might. I mean, what's interesting here, I think, is that, well, you see the decorations, right? You see the swastikas. There's not that many people actually watching, right? Very different to Triumph of the Will, where it shows these huge throngs and these crowds and things. But this is almost a subversive image in the sense of, well, yes, they're showing off German military might, but there's not that many people around this area. Now, there are some more back here, so hard to know what the actual context is. But certainly, this, this, this to me is a very interesting image because it, he doesn't seem to have realized that he almost presented the or total, documented the wrong, the opposite view that he probably wanted to in that sense. So we have images like this. We also have a number of images that show sort of the um, scenes from within the stadiums where this would have happened. This would have been the Nuremberg Parade Ground. And of course, there actually was a documentary made of this rally. This was a couple of years after the one shown in Triumph of the Will. There was a far inferior and much um, less good documentary made of, of this one. But what's interesting is I've seen this exact shot from the other angle in that documentary. So you can see the stands where Pickerivers would have been and everyone sort of saluting in that way. So this is a, just a, a fascinating image, I think. It clearly makes us really feel like we're there in the stands. He would have been again in the VIP sections at the very top of the grandstand watching. This would be an SA or SS parade, sort of hard to see which. And then we see sort of the groups in the back that are massing and preparing to march in that sense. And then we have, beyond the parade ground, we have the parades in the streets. This would be the most famous part of the Nuremberg rally. So this would be where there's bands and various um, things playing. And again, we have Nuremberg completely decked out in swastikas, all of the accompaniments that would have been there. Again, I think a somewhat subversive image in the sense that there's not that many people standing around. We don't have huge throngs of people packed out to, to the streets here. And many of them are in uniforms. These are people that wouldn't have come of their own volition. They would have come in sort of a, a compulsory way. So we have images of this sort. Again, just, just one more quickly. And again, we can see here, this is another one. Actually, the documentary made about this rally has the opposite angle, so you can see where he's standing, um, shot the other way. And of course, here we have Hitler in the middle. So in this scene, in the documentary made about this rally, Hitler drives up in his open-top Mercedes, makes sort of a U-turn, salutes the SS officers that are there with a standard salute, and then proceeds to give a speech. Well, we're standing among the SS officers. Rivers is standing among them. And he has another shot, unfortunately slightly overexposed, showing sort of Hitler and his honor guard. So this is the clearest shot in the Rivers collection of the, um, of the rally itself. What's fascinating here is if you look really carefully, you can see the camera. You can see the camera documenting it. On that truck is the video camera making the documentary that you can check out. So absolutely fascinating. It's the reverse angle of this event. This is an unremarkable Nuremberg rally. This one is not nearly as famous as the one that Lady Riefenstahl documented. I went through the proceedings of this. Hitler makes no major policy announcements at all in this speech. He simply does this parade. So what he's doing here is these guys, so this would have been, I believe that's, um, I believe that's Gehring, actually, Herman Gehring in the car. But he would have been saluting these officers who are carrying the standards of their respective sort of SS divisions in that way. So this is what he goes off to Germany and does. 
again, feels no shame about this per se. He literally is documenting this for posterity. These photographs are contained in presentation albums that later on will be confiscated by the British government. So this is a very interesting sort of moment in that way. When he comes back from this trip, in 1938, Bit Rivers publishes his final sort of major work. This book is called The Czech Conspiracy. Now, in addition to that trip to Nuremberg that I just showed you photographs of, Pitt Rivers made a visit to the Sudetenland, to this area of Czechoslovakia, as it was then constituted, that had a large German population. And this large German population, according to Hitler and, and sort of Nazis, was being oppressed by the Czechs. They were being brutally oppressed, and consequently, the Germans said they had to step in to protect this minority population. Well, Pitt Rivers goes off to the Sudetenland and does a scientific investigation of these people. And he tries to sort of ascertain supposedly, oh, what's going on with them, how well are they treated, all of these things. Now, there's all sorts of reasons why the Sudetenland would be a mess in this period. This is the middle of the Great Depression. This is an area that's not in a major metropole. So there's all sorts of economic problems. It's an area where agricultural prices have plunged, so people are going to be plunged into poverty anyway. But he sees all of these things that he finds reprehensible in that way. He's claims that the Germans are being deeply oppressed and that only Hitler's government can really save them in that sense. So he supports the annexation of the Sudetenland. What's more disturbing even than that, though, is that he claims again that he's uncovered a Jewish conspiracy. So he claims in the Czech conspiracy that the Jews are plotting a second world war. That now they've, they've convinced the world, he thinks, that the Sudeten Germans are not oppressed, which he claims to know the contrary of, and he says, I've now uncovered the second conspiracy, I'm trying to warn everyone about this. It's easy to look at this and say this is insanity. Obviously this is propaganda, and we know that Pitt Rivers' views of this were deeply influenced by Hitler's government itself. They actually set up his visit in that sense. They greased the wheels that he could talk to the right people and wouldn't encounter the wrong people in that way. But at the time, this was fairly well received by the British population. We have the list where um, well, we have the list of the presentation copies that he sent to people. So we know that this book got into the hands of some very prominent people. We also know, interestingly, that he sent many copies to the United States, where it ended up in the hands of people that were leaders in the American fascist movement. And yes, there was a very large American fascist movement and a large anti-interventionist movement in this period, led in part, not a Nazi sympathizer per se, but by Charles Lindbergh. So the guy who had flown across the Atlantic, deeply, deeply opposed to intervention in World War II in this period. So this is the milieu that the Rivers is running in. He's a significant figure in that way. So one final document here. This is a letter from Pitt Rivers to Adolf Hitler. This is 1938, essentially thanking him for the great time he had at the Nuremberg rally. Interestingly enough, when you read the diaries of some of the other people that were here, you learn that what really went on behind the scenes besides all of that was that they partied really, really hard. So there's an account of someone sort of throwing up from drinking too much in like the back of one of the open top Mercedes, and these are like the British representatives to, to the Nuremberg rally. So not, not the best impression that was made for anyone in that, but absolutely, um, sort of a bizarre thing. So he writes to Hitler and thanks him for his hospitality in that way. So by 1939, this guy, George Rivers, is one of the key people in that Nazi sympathizer milieu that I talked about. He's widely recognized as a scientific leader among these people who are deeply anti-Semitic and deeply racist. He's seen as a political leader in the sense that he's a recognizable academic who is supposedly or openly supporting Nazi Germany in this period. He's really becoming a key individual. So in 1940, this all comes back to Biden. So when Britain enters the war in September of 1939, it there's this phony war period that goes on, but then the war very quickly heats up in 1940. So, in June of 1940, as the blitz is really beginning, as the war is getting underway properly in Britain, Pitt Rivers is actually arrested by the British Security Services under an interesting statute, what's called Defense Regulation 18B, which was a statute that essentially said the British government can arrest anyone at once without any legal recourse. It can arrest anyone who's suspected of being a German spy, a Nazi sympathizer, someone who endangers national security, can toss him in jail for as long as it wants to with really no legal ramifications. Never charged with any crime, never have to face any kind of judge, never really have even access to legal counsel unless they want to give you legal counsel in that sense. So, very interesting legal statute, very controversial to this day in Britain, and we're only now as historians finding out a lot of the nuances of what went on here and why. National Archives actually in, in London has only recently um, 
declassified a lot of these documents. So it's still a very active historical investigation in that sense. So Pitt Rivers gets picked up, they literally come to this house, they raid it, they take all those photographs that I showed you, those are taken to London where they're analyzed by intelligence officers. So all of that stuff gets returned to them, and when I um, sort of first went through it, it was still in the original MI5 packages, was still actually sealed with strings, which was kind of weird to be cutting open, even though they'd only been you know, sealed 60, 70 years ago at that point. But still very weird to be opening up things that say MI6 and MI5 on them. So, under interrogation, we know that Pitt Rivers tries to appeal his detention. These records only became declassified about two years ago. He claims that all of his contacts in Germany, all of those visits he made, they were purely out of academic interest. They, he says they had nothing to do with being a Nazi sympathizer. Sure, he says, I had some sympathies for Hitler, but those were simply because I'm a scientific practitioner. I thought that his eugenics views were correct. I thought that his view of the you know, world conspiracy type of thing was correct. He says, I wasn't a disloyal British person. I was simply interested in what was going on in Germany. So this is the case that he makes. How does the British government respond to this? They say, yeah, right, and they throw away the key on him. So this guy remains in custody for like two years until they finally let him out in 1942 for health reasons. And they only really let him out then because he's actually dying at that point. He actually, his, the wound that he has on his leg is never properly healed, it turns out, so it's getting like gangrenous, which is really gross. And so they eventually let him out to have surgery. In that sense. So in 1942, he is released from prison. He will live a while longer, so never publishes another major work in that sense. This is a fascinating photograph for a whole other set of reasons. So this is George Pitt Rivers here, carrying his heavy walking stick, which is characteristic of him, because of course he cannot really walk. This is uh, 1946. So this is a couple of years after he is released from released from custody post-war. This is Captain Julian Pitt Rivers. This is his son, who will become a major anthropologist in his own right. Very different than his father. Julian Pitt Rivers is seen today as one of the leaders of late 20th century anthropology in that way. This guy, interestingly, in the middle, is King Faisal II of Iraq, who comes to the Pitt Rivers estate to learn how to farm when he's a young boy. So King Faisal of Iraq actually stays in their house. Faisal of Iraq is the king, by the way, who will be machine gunned in the famous coup a few years down the road, leading eventually a few decades later to the rise of Saddam Hussein. So there's actually a correlation in that sense. Faisal was the British-backed boy monarch who came to the throne to represent British interests effectively. Obviously he spends quite a lot of time in Britain learning from, I mean, who knows what he learned from the Pitt Rivers, that could be quite an interesting uh, conversation in that sense. But he is, certainly spends a few months with the Pitt Rivers family, in part because of their social connections and in part because Julian Pitt Rivers is seen as a very respectable figure at that point. And then he sort of goes back to Iraq and will be killed only a few years after this photo was taken. So, interestingly enough, this is their one sort of bro uh, one sort of brush with fame following this very very negative period in the 1930s. So, the Rivers, for the rest of his life, remains resentful of his internment in the Second World War. He always claims, late in life, when you look at his post-war writings, that the um, his internment was a sort of a Jewish plot, that he didn't deserve to be interned because he wasn't a threat to national security, that he had been set up by his political opponents and his enemies in that way. And so he's a deeply resentful and deeply sort of delusional man in that sense. Predictably denies that the Holocaust took place. So when the Nuremberg trials wrap up and these German um, officers and sort of Nazis are hanged, he claims that this is victor's justice. So the Nuremberg trial, he says, is simply victory justice. There should have been nothing done. Second World War, he says, never should have happened. It was all part of this plot and therefore a failure in that sense. This is a man who has very strange views that he carries with him for his entire life in that sense. And just to wrap up, he dies in 1966, I should say. So he lives about two decades after his internment wraps up, but really he never recovers from the physical trials that he undergoes as well as the sort of destruction of his career in that sense. So, I would argue that the Pitt Rivers story plays a couple of important roles in the existing historiography. This is, of course, Oswald Mosley and Vito Mussolini. So, these are the two faces of the far right as they're sort of most widely represented today. Mussolini, of course, this leader in Italy. Oswald Mosley, the leader of the biggest fascist party in Britain in that sense. I think that what's interesting about the Pitt Rivers story is this shows that there's more intellectual sophistication to these movements than was previously known. In some ways, the Pitt Rivers story is a very cautionary one showing how these academic circles can effectively get tied with politics so closely that they're almost indistinct in that way. This is certainly a very dangerous thing for academics to be getting involved with. 
Hey, Rivers actually uses his academic credibility, uses his connections to Oxford and Malinowski and these people and institutions that are venerable academic figures and places to further his political agenda, which is a reprehensible and sort of outrageous one in that sense. I think for too long, actually, historians have taken these groups too lightly. I think there's a, a view, up until a few years ago even, that these far-right groups were sort of eccentric outliers in some sense. Yes, they were, they were there, but they weren't all that serious. They never really posed that great a threat to the British state. I think that's the wrong view to take. I think these groups are very serious and very threatening in that way. People like Pierre Rivers have a great deal of quote-unquote credibility in this period, academically, politically. He's tied into all the right people. Winston Churchill is one of his cousins. Had history gone a little bit differently, this guy couldn't have ended up as the Ministry of Science, or as the Minister of Science under the Nazi occupation. Had the Germans actually invaded in 1940, he would have almost certainly provided them with material support for the invasion in that sense. So these people were, I think, really dangerous from the, from the British perspective. And I think their views deserve to be examined with an eye towards figuring out why they were able to harbor such dangerous views and dangerous friends for so long in that respect. And I think Susan Dunn's new work entitled 1940, which came out, I think, two or three months ago, is really, I, I highly recommend checking it out. Dunn talks about 1940 in the United States under similar circumstances. Talks about the Republican Party's isolationist views in this period, the view that, that Roosevelt should not get involved at all in Europe. A very um, difficult political struggle that Roosevelt had to engage with, and one that we tend to forget about today, I think. And finally, I think as a, as a plug to an article that I recently wrote, um, I think the role of science in all this is really interesting. The fact that Pierre Rivers constantly claims, oh, I wasn't, I wasn't political at all, I was just a scientist. I was just taking it where scientific inquiry told me. I was interested in eugenics because it was science. I was interested in Nazism because it was scientific in that way. I think we really need to take that consideration seriously and look at the science of racism and determine how influential these sort of quote-unquote scientific ideas are on these extremist movements in that period. Thank you very much for your time.